Hi there, Prakaptan. Welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, Tanner Campbell, and I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm sharing a letter from Seneca, letter 18, which is entitled On Festivals and Fasting. In this letter, you'll find some of the basis for the often suggested activity of cold showers and, in general, premeditatio malorum, which I'm sure is a phrase you've heard before. We will discuss premeditatio malorum after we've heard the letter. Before I start, I'd like to note that it is raining outside the window next to my recording area. And so if you hear a little bit of uh, rain falling on the window, don't hold it against me. The show must go on. Here it is, letter 18 of Seneca's Moral Letters to Lucilius on Festivals and Fasting. It is the month of December, and yet the city is at this very moment in a sweat. License is given to the general merrymaking. Everything resounds with mighty preparations, as if the Saturnalia differed at all from the usual business day. So true it is that the difference is nil that I regard as correct the remark of the man who once said, Once December was a month, now it is a year. If I had you with me, I should be glad to consult you and find out what you think should be done, whether we ought to make no change in our daily routine or whether, in order not to be out of sympathy with the ways of the public, we should dine in gayer fashion and doff the toga. As it is now, we Romans have changed our dress for the sake of pleasure and holiday making, though in former times that was only customary when the state was disturbed and had fallen on evil days. I am sure that if I know you are right, playing the part of an umpire you would have wished that we should be neither like the liberty-capped throng in all ways, nor in all ways unlike them. Unless, perhaps, this is just the season when we ought to lay down the law to the soul and bid it be alone in refraining from pleasures, just when the whole mob has let itself go in pleasures. For this is the surest proof which a man can get of his own constancy. If he neither seeks the things which are seductive and allure him to luxury, nor is he led to them. It shows much more courage to remain dry and sober when the mob is drunk and vomiting, but it shows greater self-control to refuse to withdraw oneself and to do what the crowd does, but in a different way. Thus, neither making oneself conspicuous or becoming one of the crowd, for one may keep holiday without extravagance. I am so firmly determined, however, to test the constancy of your mind that, drawing from the teachings of great men, I shall give you also a lesson. Set aside a certain number of days, during which you shall be content with the scantest and cheapest fare, with coarse and rough dress, saying to yourself all the while, Is this the condition that I feared? It is precisely in times of immunity from care that the soul should toughen itself beforehand for occasions of greater stress, and it is while fortune is kind that it should fortify itself against her violence. In days of peace, the soldier performs maneuvers, throws up earthworks with no enemy in sight, and wearies himself by gratuitous toil, in order that he may be equal to unavoidable toil. If you would not have a man flinch when the crisis comes, train him before it comes. Such is the course which those men have followed who, in their imitations of poverty, have every month come almost to want, that they might never recoil from what they had so often rehearsed. You need not suppose that I mean meals like Timon's or Popper's Huts or any other device which luxurious millionaires use to beguile the tedium of their lives. Let the palate be a real one, and the coarse cloak. Let the bread be hard and grimy. Endure all this for three or four days at a time, sometimes for more, so that it may be a test of yourself instead of a mere hobby. Then, I assure you, my dear Lucilius, you will leap for joy when filled with a pennyworth of food. 
and you will understand that a man's peace of mind does not depend upon fortune, for even when angry, she grants enough for our needs. There is no reason, however, why you should think that you are doing anything great, for you will merely be doing what many thousands of slaves and many thousands of poor men are doing every day. But you may credit yourself with this item, that you will not be doing it under compulsion, and that it will be as easy for you to endure it permanently as to make an experiment from time to time. Let us practice our strokes on the dummy. Let us become intimate with poverty, so that fortune may not catch us off guard. We shall be rich with all the more comfort if we once learn how far poverty really is from being a burden. Even Epicurus, the teacher of pleasure, used to observe stated intervals, during which he satisfied his hunger in miserly fashion. He wished to see whether he thereby fell short of full and complete happiness, and if so, by what amount he fell short, and whether this amount was worth purchasing at the price of great effort. At any rate, he makes such a statement in the well-known letter written to Polyanus in the archonship of Carinus. Indeed, he boasts that he himself lived on less than a penny, but that Metrodorus, whose progress was not yet so great, needed a whole penny. Do you think that there can be fullness on such fare? Yes, and there is pleasure also. Not that shifty and fleeting pleasure, which needs a fillip now and then, but a pleasure that is steadfast and sure. For though water, barley meal, and crusts of barley bread are not a cheerful diet, yet it is the highest kind of pleasure to be able to derive pleasure from this sort of food, and to have reduced one's needs to that modicum which no unfairness of fortune can snatch away. Even prison fare is more generous, and those who have been set apart for capital punishment are not so meanly fed by the man who is to execute them. Therefore, what a noble soul must one have to descend of one's own free will to a diet which even those who have been sentenced to death have not to fear. This is indeed forestalling the spear thrusts of fortune. So begin, my dear Lucilius, to follow the custom of these men, and set apart certain days on which you shall withdraw from your business and make yourself at home with the scantiest fare. Establish business relations with poverty. Dare, O oh my friend, to scorn the sight of wealth, and mold thyself in kinship with thy God. For he alone is in kinship with God who has scorned wealth. Of course, I do not forbid you to possess it, but I would have you reach the point at which you possess it dauntlessly. This can be accomplished only by persuading yourself that you can live happily without it as well as with it, and by regarding riches always as likely to elude you. But now I must begin to fold up my letter. Settle your debts first, you cry. Well, here is a draft on Epicurus and he will pay down the sum. Ungoverned anger begets madness. You cannot help knowing the truth of these words, since you have had not only slaves, but also enemies. But indeed, this emotion blazes out against all sorts of persons. It springs from love as much as from hate, and shows itself not less in serious matters than in jest and sport. And it makes no difference how important the provocation may be, but into what kind of soul it penetrates. Similarly with fire, it does not matter how great is the flame, but what it falls upon. For solid timbers have repelled a very great fire. Conversely, dry and easily inflammable stuff nourishes the slightest spark into a conflagration. So it is with anger, my dear Lucilius. The outcome of a mighty anger is madness and hence anger should be avoided, not merely that we may escape excess, but that we may have a healthy mind. There are three main points I'd like you to take away from this letter. 
I'll go through them in order of earliest in the letter to latest in the letter. The first, and also the last, as it turns out, is a comment on luxury and wealth. From the letter, it reads, For this is the surest proof which a man can get of his own constancy, if he neither seeks the things which are seductive and allure him to luxury, nor is led into them. Luxury is, of course, not a great sin. It's not a sin at all. Your fancy meals, your nice car, your designer clothes, these things are not unstoic. Instead, they are, like so many things, indifference. But we seem to struggle with seeing them this way. What does having a Gucci handbag say about our character? That we are good? That we are bad? Or does it say nothing at all? The answer, of course, is that it says nothing at all. That's not to say there aren't considerations in the answering of this question that might change the answer. For example, how you came to own that Gucci handbag, did you steal it? That might change the answer. A gold ring isn't a good or bad thing, but a gold ring begot by robbing someone is, well, still an indifferent thing, but the way we came about it says something negative about our character. What Seneca is saying here is that a virtuous person may well be very rich or very poor or somewhere in the middle, but that's not the point. The point is that he or she doesn't require avoidance of poverty or attainment of wealth to possess that virtuous nature. That a virtuous person is unbothered by poverty and never in lustful search of wealth. The virtuous person is a person who doesn't allow discomfort or comfort, nor the fear or allure of such things, to negatively impact the quality of their character. The second point I feel that Seneca is making in this letter is one that is at the roots of premeditatio malorum, which is a Latin saying, again, you've probably heard it before, and one which has become as ubiquitous in the Stoicism community as memento mori and, you know, nearly as commercialized. Again from the letter, set aside a certain number of days during which you shall be content with the scantiest and cheapest of fare, with coarse and rough dress, saying to yourself, all the while, is this the condition that I feared? There are no shortage of people telling you to take cold showers to build resilience, as if normalization of experience and resilience were the same thing. Take cold showers every day if you like, but it will only make you resilient to cold showers, and only ones as cold as the ones you've been taking. Cold showers aren't going to help you endure being enslaved, or having your heart broken, or watching your youngest child die. Resilience is a sort of all-encompassing quality of character. It isn't a thing you practice, necessarily. It's a sort of knowledge you attain, not, in fact, unlike virtue. Imagine if resilience were a thing you trained through activities like cold showers or push-ups. Be physically fit and you're resilient to exhaustion. Take cold showers and you're resilient to cold showers. Watch 100 of your friends die at a young age and you're resilient to death. Does it really work that way? I certainly hope there's a better way to be resilient to loss without having to practice it daily or watch some arbitrary number of people die so you're acclimated enough to loss that you no longer feel its negative emotions. That sounds more like deprivation than resilience, doesn't it? In any event, Seneca isn't suggesting you take cold showers to become resilient, thank goodness. Instead, he's suggesting that you schedule a few days a month to be reminded of your good fortune. Spend a day hungry with a cold shower or two, and perhaps a few slices of expired bread, and in so doing, you might realize two things. First, that the quality of your life could be worse, and there's no small amount of good fortune that is helping to keep that from being the case. And secondly, you might say to yourself, this isn't something so terrifying or impossible that I couldn't endure it if I had to. Perhaps I should spend less time fearing a lower quality of life, for look how possible it really is to live less fortunately than I do. 
none of this, in my opinion, is really that useful. And in Seneca's case, it feels like we've got a pretty fortunate, rich, older guy trivializing what it means to really endure poverty and discomfort. Experiencing hunger for a day or three or a week may well keep you feeling fortunate for what you have, but it doesn't exactly equate to enduring hunger for months or years. And the suggestion that it does or could feels a bit like Seneca hasn't ever endured much of anything. It's almost like a sprinter telling a long-distance runner that it's easy to run at a top speed, and the long-distance runner kind of rolling their eyes and thinking, I mean, sure, for 50 meters, not 30 miles. But you don't know that because you've never been a long-distance runner. Seneca is obnoxious in this way, though luckily not too frequently. His last point connects with the first, and it's one I enjoy. For he alone is in kinship with God who has scorned wealth. Of course, I do not forbid you to possess it, but I would have you reach the point at which you can possess it dauntlessly. This can be accomplished only by persuading yourself that you can live happily without it as well as with it, and by regarding riches always as likely to elude you. Now remember, God to the Stoics is nature slash the universe. So Seneca is reminding us that nature has no use for wealth, nor a scorn for poverty. Instead, these are human concerns that do nothing to increase or decrease a human's ability to be in alignment with nature, or in the Stoic case, with God. If you have poverty, it doesn't matter in concerns to the quality of your character, and if you have wealth, it's the same. So a person should endure poverty or wealth dauntlessly, meaning without one's character being at all affected by it. If you're poor, don't turn sourly against society and become vicious. You can be a poor sage, you can be a poor prokopton. Lack of money does nothing to your character unless you allow it to. If you're rich, don't turn arrogantly against society. Retreat away from your duties to the cosmopolis and become vicious in doing so. You can be a rich sage. You can be a rich prokopton. Surplus of money does nothing to your character unless you allow it to. Be poor, or be wealthy, or be average, but be stoic all the same. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to join our Discord community at stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord. There's a link in the show notes to discuss this and any other episode you find worthy of further discussion. Also, lest you forget, Stoicism workshops are available every month and you can check them out at actualstoicism.com. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you.